John is a member of the uh, Sheriff's Department uh, Communications Unit, which maybe some of you know about, maybe some of you don't. He's certainly going to explain it to you, and he's going to tell you about, um, I, I hope he gets and tells you a little bit how, how he became a member and what he gets to do. Um, with that, John, I'm going to uh, let you have the, have the floor, so you know how to do it. Go for it, guy. All righty. Um... Hi, my name is John Swallow. I'm uh, Kilo Zero Delta Yankee Yankee. And um, I've been a member of the Sheriff's Unit since I think we started around 2009. And I got sworn in 2000, just after about July of 2011. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a commitment. It takes about two years worth of training to uh, rise to full membership. However, the only diff real difference between being a full member and being a trainee is trainees can't drive. <laughs> uh, so other than that, uh, you pretty much do everything. Um, there's a, a, a form that I thought I was going to add that I didn't. It basically has a list of all the different trainings. And the way you get, do, you, the way you get trained is to show up at the meetings because every um, – every meeting with the exception of December is a training. So uh, <laughs> we have combinations of things like uh, uh, first responder, first aid, um, driving county vehicles, uh, uh, evidence, um, crime, crime scene protection, uh, how to, how to uh, run a, a helicopter LZ, mm. um, which we actually did come to think of it. Um, we got sent up to the uh, uh, Sonoma fires, I think, and that would be 2018, I think. And uh, they had us set up the Gila base in uh, Healdsburg Airport. And so we supplied power and com uh, internet communications and phones to the, uh, to the uh, management team there. And uh, they decided where they were going to send the helicopters. So just an example, I think I've been... Uh, my first fire was Sobrantes, um, and we got to Butte and Napa and Sonoma and what have you, even Pacifica. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, let me uh, let me get this uh, started here. If I can, uh, I think it's that one. And share. And is, did it work? Yep. Yeah. Okay. It worked. All right, so San Mateo County, this is the uh, KC6ULT is the uh, emergency repeater that the county has. It's a VHF repeater. Uh, sits on 146865. And uh, I'm going to show you how it works and talk about other repeaters. Um, as the county, we have a series of repeaters that are portable. These are called portable assets. And we have fixed assets. Fixed assets are um, like the K, uh, KC6 ULT repeater system. And I mentioned it as system instead of repeater, and you'll see why when I get into it. Um, and we also have portable repeaters where we lay out a, a battery and a solar panel and crank up an antenna, et cetera. So we have some, then we get the next batch we get from the, from the state. Uh, OES emergency communications. And then we go to the National Internet Agency Fire Center in Boise. And uh, they have all kinds of things and I'm sure Art Delay knows all about them. <laughs> so anyway, let's see if I can get this to go. Uh, no, I'll try this one. Okay, so in theory, for those of you that are new, um, basically it's just a electromagnetic, uh, radio waves or electromagnetic radiation. And basically you need line of sight. So you go in and it, and it uh, bounces you over mountains, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so let's see if this works. Okay. <clears throat> so here we have some rocks in the, in the middle. Um, this, this low, oh, see, I can't point to it. Um, this low rock over here is going to be significant when we talk about the uh, ULT repeater system. Okay, so we stick up a repeater and now, ta-da, you can talk to each other. 
Okay. The answer here is okay. Um, National Institute Fire ca uh, Cash Radios um, are designed to be linked. So if you key up one, you key up all. So if you have multiple uh, mountain ranges or you're running a search for somebody and they are in various valleys and you place repeaters on mountaintops, et cetera, it links the two. So what you end up with, oops, what you end up with is like that. And the, the two, uh, the two uh, repeaters have a UHF link in them that uh, hooks them together so that uh, um, they, all, they all key together. And we get these, uh, and I say we get these from uh, the National uh, um, Interagency Fire Cache. So anyway, so this is how the Sheriff's Department carves up repeaters. We have orange, orange, black, and yellow pelican cases. And we get them from, that we own. And then we get some from the state. And I'll talk to you about what Nardi K is and others we get from the Interagency Fire Center in Boise. And I've got pictures for you. So basically, um, we have Codan and Daniel repeaters, which we call orange box repeaters, which you'll see some pictures of. They are either UHF, VHF, P25, or 800. Uh, the Bendex King Motorola's are usually VHF. Uh, we have some UHF with the fired people. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a modular radio mounted on a, on a, a 19 inch internal frame as a sub rack so it can just drop the modules in. Uh, aluminum case, metal plate, okay, for a mag mount. Uh, we have external sealed external power connections. So when we take it out and we put it in the rain, it doesn't short out. Um, they uh, lockable latches because we leave these out here and sometimes they try to disappear, but so far we've been pretty lucky. Um, optional AC power supply if we're near the grid. Um, and they don't draw a lot of power, which is really nice. Okay. So this is what they look like. This is the orange box. This happens to be a VTAC 37 repeater. Um, here you can see on the, uh, on the right-hand side, you've got the uh, receive and transmit connections and a power connection. Um, it's also got a pressure release since the, the, entire, the entire box is hermetically sealed. Um, if it gets hot, it gets, get the grade, gets up on pressure or if it was hot when you locked it down and, and it's cooled off, then you uh, can't get the lid open. So we have a, a pressure release to uh, open the box. And so this is what the repeater looks like. This happens to be at P25. And you can see we could just, we can just drop different modules in. So there's the repeater controller on the left, the transmitter and the receiver and the system monitor. And uh, the, the uh, cans are down here in the bottom. Uh, this happens to be a 154, 158 uh, repeater. <clears throat> and so you can just kind of see how these work. Again, they, they probably weighs about 20 pounds. So what we'd like to do is get a, a, a Polaris or a golf cart and we plug in the repeater and the, the, uh, the tower and the antenna and go driving up in the hill somewhere and lay it all out and uh, get it cranked up. So it comes as a kit. Hmm. And I think, yeah, this one is, uh, Set at four five, four four five three. Okay, the transmitter, and again, all the orange boxes are pretty much the same. So if we get a request, we could just go ahead and uh, bring one out, and everybody that uh, um, works in the sheriff's office knows how to deploy a orange box repeater. Eight hundred megahertz. Okay, and these are the Codan Daniels repeaters are smaller lighter okay um and this is what they look like there you go um so it's just a pelican case i'm sure everybody knows what they look like and this one happens to be on cal law four um 
It also comes with a, a battery that looks just like this and they plug in together. So here's the repeater. Um, but again, it's already programmed up for um, uh, Calaw 4. And in this case, um, the uh, tones are already preset. So all you have to do is roll it out, plug it in, hook up the antenna and the power and push the on button. And it uh, pretty much comes up clean. And again, here's a bat figure. Uh, here it in on the left, you see the, the power inputs. Okay. And there'll be another picture, but on your on your right, on the lower right corner, is a battery a, a battery that again comes in, plugs in, etc. And there's a, there's another one that is the solar panel con controller. And it, it would plug into the battery, keeping the battery charged while the bat the battery keeps the uh, uh, repeater running. Okay. This uh, in this case, it's this is the UHF repeater, and this is a uh, Cal OES repeater. Just for snicks and grins, it's not one of ours. Here's the battery. Um, again, it's a uh, it's about a foot square and a foot high, and. Uh, it's probably the heaviest thing we've got because it's a lead acid battery. Um, but again, it uh, uh, we explained how it works and the, and the cables are all keyed. So you, you can't, pretty much impossible to plug the wrong cable into the wrong place. As you can see, in this case, the battery enclosure, um, when you have the cables, you, you, you're forced to put them in in a certain order. By the way, both the cables have both ends on them. So you can use any cable in any location, but um, you have to plug them in in a certain certain way. Okay, and you can see that the uh, the plus minus on here would plug into the bottom one, and the top one would plug into the solar panel. So that's kind of what you're seeing there. Okay, RDKs, rapid deployment kits, we get from the state. Um, it's also the key to that is it has a uh, it has a uh, cradle point uh, cell cell link in it. So not only do we have RF, we also have cell. So that if we're someplace where there is cell service, and many times um, we aren't, but uh, if we're with a cell service, we can go ahead and set up a repeater that has a cell backbone. Hmm. Okay, so we use FirstNet, uh, which is AT and T, but the cell, this cradle points have two SIM cards in them, so we usually get like a AT and T and a Verizon or a FirstNet and a Verizon, so that um, we can uh, pick up whichever one is the, the stronger signal. And this is what it looks like. Um, you can see the Wi-Fi antennas, which we are are you can you can disconnect them and put one up. Far, farther up instead of having like a uh, instead of having like a rubber duck you can get a a, a stronger stronger antenna um, there's poe four poe marks so that we can pick up uh, uh, power cameras etc um, and then again um, we we'll run it either hook either back load it to a satellite or to the uh, to the through the cradle point to the cell service and those four are so these four squares in the middle are Sonam uh, phone chargers. So we can uh, um, charge Sonam phones that, that come with, uh, they use it as a kit. What do the cell antennas look like? I mean, oops. I mean, what, what, what do the satellite antennas look like? Oh, now let me get back over here. I pushed the wrong button. Okay, there you go. Uh, the, satellite, the satellite antennas, what you would do is we have a satellite dish on the truck, okay, and uh, okay, you can if you go to the uh, SCU website, you'll be able to. That's a just look up uh, Sheriff's Communication Unit, uh, Santa Clara or San Mateo County Sheriff, and the website is uh, it's got a whole lot of pictures of trucks with satellite dishes mounted on top of. Them. Um, the dish is a the one I think. We usually use is a four foot dish uh, on the mount and it spins up. And uh, we use uh, 
uh, one of them is a ground control and the other one is a state and I'm not sure what the state uses, but uh, the, the county has uh, two mobile command units that have uh, ground control satellites. And the problem with the satellites is we get only like uh, three megs down and one meg up. Whereas if we were on satellite, if we've got a, 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 a cradle point, we can, uh, we can probably do 10 times that. So it's always nice to have a have a cell service if there is if it's available. Depending on uh, where the call out is, we have um, missing people. We have if it's like uh, we we had uh, guys missing in in Belmont. Um, people walk away from the memory center, memory care center. Okay, so we try to use a, a RDK when that happens because that way uh, we set up repeaters. So the, the, the searchers can talk, but the answer there is, is that um, when it gets back, instead of um, trying to, to cross frequencies, it drops into the cell tower and we can drop it. So if we need to send a picture or something, a, an image of something, it uh, is a whole lot faster on cell than on satellite. And so are those cell antennas self-tracking? Uh, yes, they are. I mean, not the, not the, I mean, the satellite, the satellite antennas, yes. they're self, self tracking. What we, what we, what we do is uh, with the satellite is uh, when we start to bring it up, it does a GPS link, finds out where it is. And then it automatically goes to the reference satellite, which requires a uh, roughly between 120 to a hundred and probably 150 degrees somewhere in there, the Southern sky. And that picks up the reference satellite, and then it knows where the where the bird is reference to the to the reference satellite, and it spins up and links in. Huh. The only the only trick is is that once you set it up, you can't move. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that that's I'm sure that that satellite link is is really pricey too, as far as oh, the well, well, no, I, well, pricey is a relative term. Um, depends on what your bandwidth. You, how much bandwidth you need. Uh, see, we also can do phone on that. And uh, by default, we only use, a, we only, I think we only have eight phone lines, but uh, we can run as many as 24. And so if we need 24, we go to uh, somebody who has money and say, hey, we're gonna need money for this. It's about <laughs> $5,000 a shift, I believe. Um, yeah. extra, extra for the extra phone bandwidth, the satellite bandwidth. Uh, we also need it um, it's set up for um, when the governor decides to do a video presentation at a at a fire or something. Um, when we go there, we go we call the state and say, okay, we need more bandwidth, and they will authorize it. And what happens there is um, they build up a, a a parameter package for us, and uh, then when we bring the satellite online, it pulls in the higher bandwidth satellite package. And uh, so then we can run video. But it, uh, the fire guys like video, okay. Um, and again, here's a sun and phone and the chargers uh, for antennas. Keep it simple. We have mag mounts, wire antennas. We use anything. If we have the existing antenna, we can use it. Um, Tripod mounted antennas, Yagi antennas, um, sometimes mounted on a vehicle or a trailer. We have most of our trailers have masts on them. They're uh, um, kind of like a painter pole, only uh, about three inches in diameter. Um, and they, we can crank them out in sections uh, going up to a, is uh, 40 feet. The one thing that we always think about when we're playing with masts is power lines. Uh, I believe the uh, the 235,000 volt lines are at 36 feet, and we're at 40 feet. So uh, anytime anytime uh, we sit there and uh, say, "Okay, we're going to bring this up," um, always always watch, look up when you're bringing a pole up. Um, <laughs> there's a uh, there is a YouTube video that you can take a look at. Um, you might have seen it. Um, 
Dallas, Texas uh, fire department got a brand new, it's only two months old, um, command, mobile command vehicle, $1.2 million. Mm -hmm. And they had it and a guy decided to move it with a mast up and he drove it right into a 230,000 volt line. And the whole thing caught on fire and the dryers melted. And it's a, it's a good video, but it'll be a while before that city gives them another $1.2 million for a, a van that did only lasts six weeks. Did anybody die? No, nobody died. The other thing we do as part of the sheriff's office is you learn the lineman shuffle. In other words, if your vehicle is in contact, because we also, uh, like we, we go into a thing called storm watch which is basically whenever we're having a lovely storm, the, the atmospheric river, um, like we got called out and uh, I was there for uh, Highway 84, just uh, past Alice's restaurant, a tree came down, took the power lines down and uh, we blocked that out. But basically what you do is don't touch the ground and the vehicle at the same time. You, If you have to get out, um, you jump out and then um, sh sh shuffle your feet at least 35 feet away from the uh, vehicle, not moving more than half a shoe apart. Um, so you're kind of you're kind of going like this. Um, the reason is is that the ground is charged, and if your legs get spread or you fall down and you touch the ground in the front and you touch the ground in the back, there is a potential in the ground if the power lines are on it. And it tried, the electricity likes to find the lowest path of resistance. And since you are much more, much more uh, fluid than the, uh, the dirt, the electricity wants to go through you, that, which is by the way, a bad thing. Uh, so we're, uh, we're trained regularly on uh, doing the shuffle. Um, but yeah, so that's just kind of some of the things we do. And in this case, uh, we had the fire department uh, blocking the road and we were the we were more at the top of the hill. We we're probably half a mile away, turning cars away um, for most of the night, even though the guy says, well, I just live down here. And they go, well, we really like you to stay alive, you know? So um, pretty, pretty much we can, we can, we can do that. Um, and I, again, I just talked about the safety configuration. Okay, these are the, um, the cash radios that we order from Boise, they come in about 24 hours or less. Um, Boise issued 60, I'm gonna show you what a starter system is. So they issued 69 starter systems, 8,000 handheld radios and built 196 non-standard repeater combinations for fires. And they have, a, they have air support and they flew 483 missions last year. Uh, What's a non-standard repeater? Non-standard repeater is a different uh, pair. In other words, all, all fire radios have a, a given set of channels with a given set of frequencies so that Belmont can talk to San, uh, San Bruno, that can talk to Livermore, that can talk to Sacramento, that can talk to Caltran, or Cal Fire. And so these are all standard and everybody knows if I need to call Cal Fire, I go to band C and I turn to channel seven and that's where they're going to be. Well, it turns out if you had um, somebody, let's say we were doing uh, fires in Nevada, and Nevada didn't use the same band plan that California used, then we would set up, um, we have firefighters in Nevada and firefighters in California on different frequencies. We would set up a special repeater pair that would uh, link everybody together. And that's what a non-standard repeater is. Okay, so this is what a starter kit is. Comes on a skid, and it is a um, VHF command repeater, UHF logistic repeater, three tactical radio kits with 48 radio, VHF radios in it, logistic radio kit with 16 UHF radios, ground to aircraft link, mountaintop accessory, and remote kit. And you're going, what the hell is all that stuff? So I've got, I think, two or three pictures to, to explain it. Um, over on your right-hand side, you have uh, the ICP um, and a remote kit that goes up to VHF to the command repeater up on top of the mountain. And then it comes back down to the fire on the other side. Pretty simple, standard repeater stuff. 
one repeater, pretty easy. Okay. Um, this is a uh, incident operations backbone where, again, the same thing is happening, except we've got a, uh, doesn't do any good to point. Uh, we've got a UHF link between the two repeaters. So over on the left, we've got a command repeater, but there's two antennas. One of them is the omni antenna that goes down to all the radios and or a sector antenna. And the other one's a Yagi. There's a VHF Yagi, uh, sorry, a UHF Yagi that goes between the command repeater and the logistics repeater. And if you consider, um, in this case, the, uh, the incident command post is down somewhere behind a mountain. So we're just, here we're jumping two mountain ranges as an example. And I think this is the last one. This is, um, you've got, let's just kind of, kind of like the, uh, the Tahoe fire that was, it was uh, just under a million acres. And the command, the, uh, the incident command post goes up to the logistics repeater that sends a UHF link to the two fire incident operating areas. And so everybody can talk to everybody on multiple fires and multiple bands if they have to. So that's kind of like how that works. Um, and again, out, of, out of curiosity, what was what does one of those skits cost? Uh, we uh, rent them. We don't buy them. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm not there. Uh, there is, I think, they're probably a couple thousand dollars. There's actually a a, a price list you can get. Uh, it's, it's published. If you go to uh, go to their website, you can uh, you can a couple thousand dollars to rent it. Yeah. 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 I'm sure. I'm sure that that radio equipment in there is a fortune. Oh, yeah. They're all P twenty. They're all P twenty five radios. Yeah. <laughs> and they uh, uh, in their spread spectrum. Yep. Yeah. So. <laughs> a dollar or two. Yeah. I know. I yeah, know. I, that the, I know that the uh, the Motorola radio that I have uh, that was issued to me is a five thousand dollar radio. Yeah, I was going to say they're five thousand bucks each. And it, I mean, that's a 5,000, the 8,000s that are all banned are even, even more pricey. Okay, so here's some examples um, of setups we did. Um, different locations we're setting up. Uh, here's an orange box coming up. And, and there you can see we, it happened to be in a building. So we just kind of shoved it over the corner and ran, ran, ran grid power. And you can see the antenna. Um, <laughs> Actually, this is me. If you look on the right-hand side, I'm the guy in front there. This is our solar trailer. It's got um, it's got six panels. I can't. You can't. I don't know if you can tell that there's two panels on each one of those risers. Um, and there's a batteries are in one of the bins, and the repeaters are in the other one. But the key to this is um, we had a fire in uh, in Wonderlic, um like two years ago, and uh, we had that repeater set up on a fire, just off the side of a fire trail at uh, Flager Estate um, for like six weeks. <laughs> and it just ran. We didn't have to service it. We didn't have to go bring gas. We didn't have to do anything. We just set it up and it ran. The other advantage here is what we did is we kept the antenna, which I don't know if you can see. Well, yeah, you can see the. if you look on the left, there's the mast going up. Uh, and what we do is, um, well, here you can see on the, on the right-hand side, it's tilted down. And on the left-hand side, it's tilted up. But what we did is we mounted the antenna low so that it would hit the, it would hit the rocks. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what we do is we, we try and focus the beam, the, the, the data into the area that we need it without blasting all over the county. So we can use the same set of frequencies in multiple locations at the same time. You doing that with those? You doing that with those yaggies you were talking about? Yeah. Okay. So here's a uh, here's a Daniel's repeater with the lid off, and you can see radio one, radio two, radio three, radio four, and we just turn on whichever combination we want to use and punch them in and dial the frequencies in on the. Uh, uh, one the one is squelch and one is free, volume, one is volume and one is a uh, uh, channel and those are Kenwoods that you can see there. But there's a battery pack, and uh, you can't really see the uh, 
Um, now, does, Ken, does Kenwood or Motorola or whoever it is that the provider is come in and train you guys on these things? Uh, no, not really. We our, our own radio shop does the training. Okay. Um, but for example, in this case, we had a generator. And so that meant that, but by the way, those generators are good for about, oh, they're good for about uh, maybe a day and a half, maybe, if you fill them up before you go home. Um, otherwise, they're good for about eight hours on the, the small generators and about 16 hours in the large. And so what you need is a fuel, a fuel browser to come by every, every day or every other day and reload them. That's why we like the, uh, the solar ones, because uh, we just put it up, leave it up, and it'll just sit there and run. Um, this was at Moscone Center. Um, we just mounted the uh, repeater on a piece of plywood and hook it to a wall. And you can see the antennas um, <clears throat> going down, going down the wall in the, uh, at, the, at the center. And then the Yagi was, was set up to go uh, across the other side. Okay, so we're almost done. Um, but what we have here is this is gonna talk about our repeater system, okay? And basically what it is, it's four or five voting receivers and a transmitter and a control, set of control circuits. Um, so this is probably something you're not really familiar with, but what happens is um, this is uh, 146865 and it is, uh, it is it's, not a, it's not a closed repeater, uh, but it's not an open repeater. Basically, it's an emergency repeater. Yeah, this, uh, is, uh, this is, uh, uh, which, uh, these are commercial frequencies. Yeah. No, no, v, v, it's just VH, it's ham, VHF. 146.865 is, is a okay. Hand okay. Hand. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. This, this is the one you use for the Tuesday night sheriff's county sheriff's net. Right. Right. But basically, it's we we use it and we that that we use that to make sure that it's working. <laughs> but it also gets you. It also gets checked every morning about nine o'clock. Um, <clears throat> but the key to this system is that. You could be in Pescadero and talk to somebody in Burlingame, okay, um, or wherever. Because with and there's only right now there's only one gap we have in the system, and we have received funds and ordered the parts, and I believe the parts are sitting in the radio shop, and I'll talk about how that works in a second. Okay, so what you're looking at here is where are the radios. Okay, mm -hmm. so the yellow one is the town center. The orange one is Portola Valley. And notice we said it's a fill-in site. That means that the antenna for the VHF is low, phys physically, physically lower than the top of the mountain. So that's because the La Honda fill-in site uses the same frequency pair. So what we do is we use the mountain in between to block the signal, <laughs> okay? Um, so there's also the, um, the town ridge site that goes down to Pescadero. Um, there's the Half Moon Bay substation. Um, there's the future site of fill-in site for Pacifica, which is the one we haven't finished yet. Uh, basically, we're doing to the San Bruno water tower. And we're going to take the San Bruno water tower. And if you think about the San Bruno water tower, it, it's got a, the, around the back of it, it's got a view right down to Pacifica. So we're going to do that, but we'll mount the antenna mm -hmm. low so that it bounces into the rocks and when it tries to come back. So that way, the, all the Pacifica traffic stays in the Pacifica area. Um, and so there's also Mount San Bruno, and I believe Mount San Bruno is the top of our, of our list. Now, the question is, is I, the thing you need to know is, is Pi Mountain, which is the blue dot in the middle, is the transmitter. So what happens is um, you've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight receivers that are spread around the county. And the transmitter will, the control circuits pick up the, the request of whoever happens to be on. And you will automatically be 
linked in through whatever the strongest receiver is. And the transmitter will then say, oh, this is the strong, this is where the, the signal's coming from. And it will feed it back that way. So again, it's a, it's a, uh, a voting system where the, the, uh, Pies, the Pi Mountain transmitter <laughs> looks at all the receivers and sees how it works. And we also have microwave linking all of this. So this is how the links go. <laughs> um, so uh, you've got these, 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 uh, these are the, um, the microwave links for uh, this. So mm -hmm. you've got Pi, you've got Skyline, you've got Rolf. And here you can see the Portola Valley link goes up to Rolf Hill and then goes back to County Center um, and then eventually uh, goes over to, to uh, North Peak and then back down to Pi. So that's how the, how mm -hmm. it, if, you, if you happen to be in Portola Valley. But it, uh, it takes less than a second. I mean, we, we, don't, we don't really notice the, uh, the delays uh, as far as uh, when somebody keys up. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's push to talk, not push to think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you guys pick up the phone and go, uh, <laughs> so anyway, we also, that's why additionally, one of the things that we do for the, uh, the sheriff unit is um, every week we match a uh, trainee with a, uh, with a sworn member and you're responsible for going down and doing the, uh, the eight o'clock net. However, since there are, uh, 52 weeks and a year, and there's some 30 sworn members, um, and there's only about 10, 10 trainees. As a sworn member, you do a net maybe twice a year, uh, so it's not a not a big uh, not a big uh, uh, required there. However, the 10 trainees may have to actually go in and practice four or five times, uh, and the net is what maybe half an hour, so. <laughs> We're that, that we, we might that we might ask you to do two hours worth of work for a, a year but the idea is is that you learn uh protocols message passing etc cetera, etc cetera, in real life um so when we get a call out for something you'll be you'll be ready to go and as i said trainees um the only thing trainees don't do is drive county vehicles um so um, you go through, do all the training, and then you are written off and you know, signed off. And at the end of the sign off, you'll have a, uh, well, first you go to three meetings and the three meetings will give you, uh, an idea of what it is we do and how we do it. <clears throat> then, uh, you'll have an interview saying, do you really want to do this? And knowing that it's going to take you two years to become a full sworn, um, you are fingerprinted and background checked the FBI. So if you happen to be a felon, you probably don't want to go down this route because uh, <laughs> they will get you. Um, the only other thing is that this is a, um, this is a county, uh, this is a, uh, I call it a quasi military organization and that there's a structure, there's, uh, there's sergeants, there's lieutenants, there's captains, okay? that when they say do something, we just do it. Um, but overall, I, I've been very happy with it. Um, I like giving back to the community and uh, I find this is a really good way. Uh, <clears throat> we do, uh, we were there for the CZU fire for some 200 hours. Um, but uh, yeah, and things like, uh, uh, we, are, we set up the links for the Big Sur Marathon. So we go down to Monterey. Uh, we get called to any of the 10 counties um, in the Bay Area, and <clears throat> including down to Monterey. Uh, and as a, as a, uh, as a Cal OES asset, um, we also are, are the, have the uh, Interop Gateway for Region 2, which basically covers the coast all the way up to the Oregon border. Uh -huh. uh, so you get if that happens and you're on the Magoo team and you get called out, you'll get, um, you may be gone for two or three days. But again, that's optional. And again, because you're a volunteer, you have to volunteer. So that's how that works.
Um, and I guess that's about it for um, the, uh, that's about, that's about it for the, the uh, repeater system, how it works. Um, if you want to take a look at the website, we talk about all the different, uh, the, the different vehicles we have, the different portable, portable assets, which include generators and light trailers and uh, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. um, we said we were in charge of setting up communications for the COVID testing and the COVID vaccination site at uh, the event center. Uh, I actually set out uh, um, for the for the for the year mark for the nine months of March 2020 through January of 2021. I did daily runs out with uh, uh, cones and uh, uh, signboards and mm -hmm. light trailers to the various sites, and every morning I would go out and mm -hmm. deliver this stuff, or the night before, and then come back in the morning and set it up. Monday, Monday through Saturday, um, to make sure that was all uh, up and running. So that was, uh, I mean, it's it's a it's it's a rewarding, it's a rewarding group. Um, one of the things uh, is that we not only have we have a, a net each week, we have a meeting once a month on a training topic, which is fine, but we also <laughs> usually have about. Oh, I don't know. Um, depending on depending on the uh, on the the COVIDness, if you will. Uh, in in nineteen, uh, we did about thirty five callouts. Um, so far this year, we've only done two. Um, but things like uh, um, dream machines, which by the way got canceled yesterday. If you were thinking you were going to go, uh, <laughs> um, but we would set up the com for the for that, uh, tying in uh, the uh, um, med the medical and the uh, uh, the, air, the air the air section. Make sure that we keep out of the way of the airplanes, etc. Um, the concourse, the elegance in in Hillsboro. Um, Milbray Art and Wine, San Clara, uh, San, San Carlos, uh, um, what is it? San Carlos Days? It's a, a two day beer fest. And there was a, a beer, in, I think the, they call it Brews and Bands in, uh, in Milbray. We, uh, we again run the run this for that. Also, um, while you are not a deputy, you are a sworn sheriff's officer at the end of this. Um, which means uh, if somebody decides that they don't like you and they take a punch at you, it's the same thing as punching a deputy, uh, which is what you don't want to happen. Uh, the deputies uh, generally very, are very thankful for all the hours that we put in for them and they tend to take care of us. So um, again, that's a, just a, a, a thing that I've seen in the last decade. Um, are you planning to participate in the uh, preparedness day on uh, in July? We usually do. Um, we you'll you'll find us uh, set up. We did uh, we set it up and uh, um, again uh, for for the uh, the preparedness day we go out uh, with the uh, OES, which is now called DEM um, Department of Emergency Management, as opposed to Office of Emergency Services. Um, the county changed the name. Um, but the difference is, the main difference is, is that OES was a arm of the sheriff where DEM is, a, is under the county manager. So it's a political structure. Um, but all in all, um, there's also the, the uh, you also become eligible for a lot of training. Um, California State um, <clears throat> Training uh, Group that does all the uh, that does all the uh, uh, incident management stuff. You, the fire the fire people the fire classes. We also go to those. Um, I just went to a logistics class in at the San Francisco uh, Fire Training Center, 
uh, like two weeks ago. And then I went to another one uh, in, uh, where is that town? Uh, Dublin um, last week. And on Wednesday, I go to uh, the Sheriff's Office in Santa Cruz for a uh, class on uh, managing volunteers. <laughs> and, uh, but I mean, there's like all kinds of stuff, uh, mass casualty, um, again, uh, different types of uh, wilderness medicine. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of training that goes on like all the time. Um, and you're free to take as much of it as you want as you are members of the Seventh Hill County Sheriff's Office. So you fall under sure, the yeah. category, you fall under the how category of law enforcement. How much of a time commitment is it at a minimum? Oh, the time commitment is up to you. Okay. You don't have to go to any classes. If you want to go to a class, the classes are available and they are no charge. Okay. So John, and, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Vic. No, so as far as the, uh, um, what type of mandatory training are you talking about? You were talking about two years to become sworn. Well, what, uh, what are the requirements there to become sworn? Basically, there's two, some two dozen training classes and each one is given um, in about a 90 minute period, uh, per, one per month. So you, there's a meeting and a lot of the meetings have been Zoom meetings. Um, so you can you can do a, a Zoom if we happen to have recorded it. Uh, basically, you go with your sign up sheet. You go to the class. Uh, you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is good. I I've, I've been here. I've sat through this. I now understand how this works, and we'll sign you off. And then, when you have been signed off for all the different classes, then you will be given your second interview. The first interview gives you the uh, insurance. Uh, it's a DSW, so you're covered under uh, um, state, uh, there's a word I'm, I'm blanking on, medical uh, disability. Yeah. Liability. Yeah. Liability. Thank you. Right word. Um, health insurance. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the state DSW plan, disaster service worker. Um, then you go ahead. So once you, once you sign, sign up and say, okay, I want to be a trainee, then you're covered under insurance for going out and doing things like falling down and you know sliding down the hill in the mud uh <laughs> etc um getting your foot driven over by a trailer um, but uh you you do the 24 trainings and then you'll be given a second interview saying okay you really want to do this and you go yeah i want to do this i've done all this and you go, okay then you'll be given a packet and you'll get a background check and get fingerprinted and assuming nothing bad happens, then roughly once a quarter, we'll do a swearing system, swearing in, and you'll be sworn in as a um, an officer of San uh, County Sheriff. You'll have a badge, and you'll have a shirt that says San Mateo County Sheriff on it. Um, and with all the responsibilities that go with that, so you you learn not to drink while you're on duty. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yes, question? No question, okay. Um, but basically, uh, uh, it, it, for, for me, it was one of the, probably the biggest things is it dramatically changed how I drive, learning, being in the sheriff's office, because you see uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that civilians, if you will, don't see and don't know about. And there's a whole lot of volunteers that are in the sheriff's office don't know about. But there's also a lot that you all of a sudden become aware of. And I mean, I find that I used to, I used to, you know, stop at the light and say, okay, um, the light changes green, okay, I'll go. Now it's like, okay, I count to three before I move, which is just long enough for the guy behind me not to want to push the horn. <laughs> okay, but it's long enough for me to make sure that nobody's going to come zooming through the light at the last moment. Um, but yeah, defensive was, driving. What? Defensive driving. Oh, defensive driving. Yes, I've, uh, I've, 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 my problem is I've seen so much um, working for the county. We have people up in uh, just north of Elgin, just uh, on the south of the 
south of the uh, tunnel that seemed to want to go over the cliff a lot. <laughs> um, and then we have to go down and we work with the, uh, the, uh, dive, the cliff dive team and they go over the edge and we provide comms for them. Um, we've got been on uh, evidence searches where a guy uh, kidnapped a woman in Half Moon Bay. And uh, we went through the, uh, the, the cemetery lined, lined up two feet apart, and walked up and down and found his cell phone, which was unlocked and had a thing that said mom on it. So the uh, <laughs> deputy, by the way, as a volunteer, you never find anything. Never find anything. It's very <laughs> important. What you do is you find a deputy and go, oh, deputy, I think there's something over there that you might want to see. And then he'll go, oh, look what I found. Okay. And the, the, the main reason, there's a reason for that. And that is deputies get paid to go to court. <laughs> you don't. So if some, some, if some uh, lawyer decides that they wanted to see the person that found it and it was you, you could spend weeks sitting in court, not getting paid. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you let the deputy find it, then the deputy found it. And so he gets paid to sit in front of court. By the way, um, the, the, the person's mother was very kind to us and say, did you, did you uh, your, we think we lost, you found your son's radio or your son's phone. It says mom here. Oh, that must be Billy. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, where does Billy live? Well, get, get, we're going to go over and give it to you. Oh, Billy lives here. <laughs> <laughs> Mom didn't know Billy was, a, uh, let's see, had uh, stolen a car, uh, kidnapped somebody, and uh, I think he tried to rob an ATM. Um, but anyway, um, oh. that was, a, that was a, an, an interesting uh, extension. But yeah, so we do all kinds of stuff. Um, I pretty much phased out of cert. I was, I was doing cert for a couple of years. I finally decided I didn't want to do cert anymore. Not because cert isn't valuable, but we didn't do a lot in cert. Okay. Whereas here we do stuff all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, for example, um, Saturday we did a training for three hours. Um, and then this morning we did maintenance for two hours on vehicles. And on Wednesday, I'm going to a class for two days. And then the following Saturday, I've got another training. Uh, <laughs> and it's an hour here, an hour there, you know, it's, it's, it's whatever it is. But the key is, is that you're always doing something. Okay, you, they, they, uh, you, you stay very engaged. Um, I still go in and, uh, you know, help the cert guys when they, when they request it, like if they're going to do a, a, a specials class, okay, um, where they, they go out to the fire station and we set up stations so they can practice cribbing and putting out fires in the fire pan and first mm -hmm. aid and stuff like that. But uh, um, my primary, my primary uh, volunteer work, again, is, uh, is here. Now, just for fun, um, in 2020, I did almost, I think, 1,900 hours, which was a massive amount. Usually, I do about 600. Um, but that was just because I was driving every day to the, all the COVID testing sites, delivering stuff. Um, but mostly, I would say the average, the average person over a year might have, a, have a, a, an hour count of about... Uh, Oh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe a hundred hours. Maybe one hundred and fifty <laughs> hours. So something like overall, including including the net and the class. And so well, the net is you get one hour credit for doing the net. So that's four hours in the month, and you have a meeting that's two hours. So there's six hours. So that leaves you with roughly <clears throat> four hours worth of something a month, which, if you will, one hour a week of doing something or a two hour a two hour exercise twice a month but that's kind of kind of what it is and how it works um if you want to take a look um we are our, our phone numbers and everything are on the website um let's see if i can bring one up um 
Yeah, let's see this one, I think. Uh, yeah, John, bring up the, John, what are you do, guys doing at the end of the month on last Saturday? End of the month? Saturday. Oh, um, well, let's see. Last Saturday we did the- no, This, 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 uh, last Saturday in, 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 in February. Oh, was a ham cram. There we go. Okay, uh, just a second. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, if you go to uh, uh, smso-scu.org or go to Google and type, um, go to Google and type um, SM, SM, SMSO space SCU, <clears throat> you'll find the uh, website and it's, it's got things that it talks, to, it'll show you the, the registration, the training forms, et cetera, et cetera if you're interested. Um, like I said, we're at the first Wednesday of the month at eight o'clock, or si sorry, the first Wednesday of the month at seven o'clock is the meeting. Um, and let's see if I can tell you the March meeting will be ethics and crime scene preservation. This is a example. So you're not allowed to flash your badge. You're not allowed to Try and talk your way out of a ticket, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, things like that. Um, but generally, if you happen to be in uniform and you get pulled over uh, by a law enforcement, they will uh, think about it a little bit more before they write you a citation. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, I, I really appreciate you guys doing that Tuesday night net. I think it's a wonderful drill. And it seems like, oh, well, another drill. But I tell you, when there's a real emergency happens, that's going to be yeah. so and, valuable. And, and we're, and we're, I mean, yes, yes, the members all log in, or we try to get most of the members to log in. Um, but what's more important is the non-members logging in. Because if you're stuck somewhere, and you're at home, and all of a sudden the power went out, there's a big tree dropped in front of your driveway, and you can't get out. You pick up your call. You pick up the radio and call KC, KC six ULT, and you'll get somebody who'll go out there and get it. Somebody with a chainsaw to oh. pull you out and pull you out. Wow, that's good to know. Yeah. Anybody over in this group ever uh, uh, drive drive through Pescadero when it's raining? The Pesc the Pescadero yeah. Bridge often has oh there we have a volunteer yeah and if you ever noticed that the guys even though there's people saying don't go over the bridge they decide to go over the bridge anyway <laughs> yeah um and we had we had one guy who uh we were we were sitting at the, <laughs> the west end of the bridge going you read oh there you go so, somebody just called it up i did <clears throat> okay oh by the way that's the mcv with the uh, it, Oh, that's me. Oh, there you go. I, yep, there's John. I, I'm programming radios. Um, and those are our units. And you can see the satellite dish on top. And there's uh, some of us. And uh, that's the mobile command unit, which is a uh, uh, sprinter van. And you can see, uh, and that's the uh, mobile command vehicle. That's got a, a, a two meter dish on top of it. And there's the sheriff that saying thank you for doing all we do. But that's a just an example of some of the stuff. But anyway, I was going to say the uh, we had a, we had a guy in a BMW telling us. Uh, oh, by the way, that is the the regional vehicle that goes up to uh, the Oregon border. And basically, you can jack it up, jack the shelter up, and drive the truck away. Uh, that picture was taken at uh, at uh, Big Sur Marathon, um, and you can see the, the satellite dish on top there. And uh, there you go. Uh, that's a uh, Lake County fire. Right. Where is this stuff all sort stored down at uh, down in San Mateo? Um, some of it is if if it's an OES asset, it's stored either in San Francisco or San Jose. Um, we have. Um, a warehouse of vehicles in Belmont and at uh, 
at the county uh, county corp yard in uh, I county guess town. Redwood City, I think. Oh, off Redwood of, City. Okay. Off of Woodside Road. Uh, you mentioned in the future there's going to be coverage for Pacifica. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, basically, what we're going to do is probably going to be another 805 repeater, 146 805. And it's going to be a low site antenna so that the, the, uh, the repeater will point down into Pacifica and not go over, um, not come up come up the back and, and hit San Bruno, for example. Um, so by doing it, we have, there's only a given number of, of uh, repeater pairs that we have. So we found that by controlling the height of the antenna and the power output of the repeater, we can control where the, the signal goes. So at the moment, we, uh, we're waiting for the, uh, we're waiting for a time slot for the uh, uh, radio shop to go mount the antenna wherever they're going to mount it and set it up. If you took a look at uh, a Google map of the uh, San Bruno water tower, on the left, you'll see a, a square building, which is the county radio um, shed. It's got the standby power, et cetera, et cetera, in it. And all the county radios and microwave stuff goes there. And so we'll just basically uh, use a, uh, a Yagi uh, beam antenna and maybe a uh, reflector and point it right down into Pacific. What's the uh, best frequency to get into from Pescadero? Pescadero, I believe, is uh, the 805. Thank you. Yeah, 146805 is pretty much good for all of San Mateo County from what you're saying. Well, no, the thing is, is that the 805 is like Portola Valley and um, the um, Pescadero. Remember, those are low antennas. Okay. <laughs> so county center, if you're on the bay side, 805 won't do you any good because you'll never, you'll never get into an 805 repeater. Okay. So for example, Portola Valley can get some of the guys in Woodside can get it. Um, but <laughs> if you go, um, if you try and drive over the, to, to the east side of 280, you won't get, you won't be able to come in on, on it. It's going to, it's going to block you. The, the rocks will block. Um, on the other side, if you're on the west side <laughs> and you couldn't get into the county center side because of the, the mountain range, now you're covered. Now what's the uh, what are the frequencies for the uh, for the bay side? Bay side's 146.865. Okay. And the the PL tone is 114.8. Hey, are there any other questions? John, I want to say thank you. Mm -hmm. I saw your preliminary and you and you and you added a lot more humor to it as I suggested, <laughs> and and it came out very nicely. I'm, I'm glad I was able to put my input and perfect it for okay. you. It was only wanted. I only wanted to tell. Uh, let me see if I can find the guy who it was. Uh, uh, W2OKB. I wanted to finish that story, and that was that the we told the uh, the guy in the BMW that you shouldn't go across the road because it was flooded, and. Uh, he goes, you can't tell me what to do. And, and that's true. Okay. <laughs> and people, people don't have to listen to a volunteer. We're there to, to guide you and protect you. But if you don't want protection and you don't want to do it. So he drove around us and he got about halfway across the bridge and his car stopped. And then we go, oh, yeah. Oh, you want us to throw you a rope? <laughs> I love that story, John. I, I, I was the supervisor at Fort Point for a year, a number of years ago. And we had one of those days with the high waves that were coming up and just engulfing the road. They were going up, if, you, if you're familiar with the road that goes down to Fort Point, there's the cliff and then the road and then the bay. And the waves were just crashing over. So we closed the gate and I'm, I was posted out there. And uh, some woman was jogging with one of those three wheel stroller yeah. jogging stroller things and she insisted 
she always goes to Fort Point. There's a famous set of paws there from a, a former uh, bridge worker that helped save lives, you know, suicides. And he put these paws mm -hmm. up um, for people to hit, you know, as a part of their run. And, and she was just insistent that she was going to continue her run. And I mm -hmm. said, fine, you can leave the baby here with me and I will let you proceed. What did she say to that? She <clears throat> gave me a dirty look and walked away. Uh, <laughs> so our, our guy got stuck, got stuck on the bridge. And we said, yeah, that, we'll get you a rope. So we had, a, we had, a, had, had the guys go across and we got a rope across. He said, okay. He says, well, how am I going to get it? And they go, well, you're going to have to open the door. <laughs> Mark, roll down the window. He said, the windows won't roll down. He said, short it out. And I go, well, you can break the glass or you can open the door and get out. And so he opened the door and the car filled with water um, and mud. And but I mean, the problem there was we were talking to him. We said, well, you know, so when they take it out, the, the tow truck came and finally hauled it off. We said, well, you know, your, your wheel bearings are now full of mud. Your transmission vent line is now filled the transmission full of mud. Uh, your, your differential is probably also full of mud. And uh, all your electronics are now uh, probably not functioning. But you didn't have to listen to us. <laughs> You know, some something of that uh, nature happened in Millbury not too long ago. Oh, on Hill or Hillside. Yeah. Not, and I and two people died from that. Oh, I'm and sorry two, to hear that. Yeah, right. and two other people narrowly narrowly made it out. But I I never knew about that that underpass. So I drove down there myself. Oh, the, and, the, under, the underpass filled up with water. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, one yeah. near the and, one near Burger King. Yeah. Right, so I drove down there myself, and I, as I was approaching the underpass, I noticed all kinds of signs. Do not, do not uh, advance if there's water in there. And so I drove, and it's pretty darn deep too. Yeah. So well, you know, it's another example of uh, people not not, not paying when attention. I, when I moved to Arizona, I had to learn about flash floods. Oh um, yes, yeah. And it was a serious thing. I mean, it, it killed people. You know, mm -hmm. and it was something I was totally unaware of. I mean, in Ohio, we had fjords. I mean, not um, oh, what's a road that goes through a little stream? Uh, there's a name. Ford. For Ford. Yeah, Ford. Right. And we had those, but they didn't tend to flood that often. And when they did, you know, the city would put up barricades and stuff. But in Arizona, you could be sitting there, bright sun, dry day. Mm -hmm. And in 10 seconds, there's this tidal wave of water coming through some low land. Yep, it's coming from a long way away up in the mountains. Yeah, yeah. Yep. yeah. And the thing is, is for example, we have a, I don't know if you'd call it a high water vehicle. It's a, a like an F-550 with uh, dualies on the back and a, and a great big uh, box. We have chainsaws and winches and shovels, et cetera, that we uh, will pull somebody out with. <clears throat> uh, but uh, it's not really a, that high high water high that's not that high up but it's well, it's probably got two foot of clearance underneath it which compared to things like priuses are <laughs> they cut right down and on, down on the road um there's a, there was, there was a, a a guy at the um at an intersection in redwood city uh, in a pickup truck that says on the tailgate it said i i identify as a prius <laughs> but anyway so, so folks i i, I want to say good night i have to run right now i have something else going on i need to get to but i wanted to mention if you're not familiar with it because it came up uh the incident command system um that was created because of the fires in southern california in 1970 and and a total lack of, of ability to communicate well with each other um which certainly relates to tonight's topic you can go to the fema um ICS uh, training site, and they offer free online training in the in yep. command, in incident command system. Um, I mean, it's not all free, it's not all online, but a lot of it is. And it's really good stuff. And you even get a certificate, you have to print that yourself. <laughs> but you know, who doesn't like to get a certificate once in a while? But you know, since it came up tonight, I wanted to mention that that's there and available for free for anyone. Right. And the thing is, is 
Um, the only the only ad what advantage is like um, the sheriff's office says there's a series of tests or classes you have to take as part of the training. But as a as a member of uh, as a member of the sheriff's uh, community, um, <clears throat> you can take the the in person classes at no charge. Yeah, they have they have several that we took uh, um, ICS 100 and <clears throat> ICS 700 very valuable classes. Right. But for example, the, uh, you take 100, 100, 200, 300, 700, 800 are the, no, 100, 200, 700, 800 are the online classes. And then 300 and 400 are in-person classes. <laughs> and normally um, those are hard. Well, you, you can go and try and sign up for them as a, as a, um, as a citizen just say I want to take this class and they may if there's space they'll let you in um, however if you are a member of a uh, first responder organization you're mo much more likely to get in well good night uh, folks thank you for the presentation it was oh, really uh, thank, thank you very much for coming tonight right um, I had one question for Ari <clears throat> if he's still with us Ari Ari <clears throat> are you with us I am uh, do, can you make any comment about ICS classes? Um, yeah, the, the 100, 200 level are great starters in the IS uh, 100 and uh, 700. Um, those are really good ones for folks it, kind of in your capacity working with, you know, the ham radio and how to interface with first responders. That's kind of the starting point uh, of it. So I would, they're, they're all self-study, self-paced classes. And they, they give you the, all the basics. Sorry, my little guy's uh, no, stuck okay. here with his buddies on his computer. So oh, <laughs> sorry for all okay. the racket. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, but those would all support the mission. Okay. All right, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, drop off and let you guys continue on. Thanks, John. Okay. Thank you. You did a great thank job. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, John. You. Our 